French anymore. Look at his little face. This is my best side. Adventures is primarily known, you know, for the digs that we do. We're also born digital, and so from the beginning, we've we've had this whole aspect to the business that happens online and away from the trenches to try to do our best so that people who aren't actually here or can't be here and join us on site can can see what we're doing all the time. And so one of the projects that we started last year, completely digital, it's something I'm incredibly excited about and is so unusual, is called Deep Time. I'm Kim and I'm the Programme Manager at Dig Ventures. I'm in charge of the digital side of the programme, so GIS, geophysics, GPS data, anything involving digital deliverables and technology, that's my thing. Ben, yes. what do you think to these cool features in the LiDAR? Oh, what have you got? Oh, wow. This could be something. Looks like there's an entrance there. Very cool. And then there's another two further down here. There's three there, isn't there? But it doesn't look like there's anything on the aerial photography. Maybe a crop just mark a there. Archaeology isn't just about digging. And so there's this real interest in how, actually how do you decide where to dig? How do you find new archaeological sites? What does that mean? Can it help us preserve our historic environment better if we have a better understanding of where all the different sites are in the landscape? So what we usually do at this point when we're doing a rehearsal is we just kind of whiz through each person's section. Okay. So we've got Kim, who is um, our amazing map person. We've got Iris, who is our amazing AI person. Brendan, who is holding the whole thing together. Um, I'm not amazing. I, no <laughs> I noticed just... I wasn't amazing. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm um, fine with that. The Deep Time project is using CIAI. So it's crowd intelligence. Um, we'll basically be training a crowd to find archaeology through non-intrusive methods such as LIDAR, aerial photography, historical maps, the historical environment record and then that data will then train the artificial intelligence. It'll find algorithms in our data and apply them to find all sorts of different archaeological remains within the landscape. We had a thousand applicants to, to want to join our team of a hundred um, participants, which we affectionately called pastronauts. Yeah, we had to increase the number yeah. by 50% because there was just too many good applications. Yeah. We couldn't, we couldn't bear to turn some of the people down. Iris, it was heartbreaking. I mean, it really was. About 200 people wrote essays of why they wanted to do it. And um, we had to pre-select around 70 people based on demographics, um, ethnicity, and, and where they were placed, which meant that of those 200, we could only take, what, 70. Um, and it was just savage. This is it. I like it. There's a badge and everything. <laughs> We are literally 11 minutes and 27 seconds away from launching Deep Time. Uh, we're starting to get our astronauts arriving and we're going to be taking them through what they're doing for the next eight weeks and give them their first chance to try and find archaeological sites. And so on. It's so exciting. And, um, submitted the archaeology at home for this Brendan this, uh, is also Austria. telling so us we that we've just won an award. Open award. We just won this extra one today. It's, <laughs> it's, it's pretty good. cool. It is pretty damn cool. Congratulations. They just keep coming in. Our question was, can we teach a crowd of people well enough that they can then teach the AI? Hi everyone, hello. It's so nice to see you all here. I am so unbelievably excited. Welcome to the Deep Time launch party. So much of recognising an archaeological site is to do with being human, with recognising things that we as other humans understand and recognise. And um, yeah, seeing an AI try to attempt to do the same thing was a real eye-opener. Rich and Fo. 
hiding under there. You can kind of see it on the satellite, but then as soon as you put the LiDAR up, you can really see it. The AI had a tendency to have a look at things like uh, roundabouts and assume that they're burial mounds or um, have a look at roads and think that they're huge long walls. And so I think part of the process actually showed us how complicated what we're doing as people looking for archaeological sites is. The star of deep time was going to be the AI, right? Everyone's AI, AI, you know, this is the thing. But what we discovered is that actually we, we can't build, right now at least, an AI that can identify all the archaeology and, and do it perfectly. In fact, the crowd was still better at it than the AI. Come on, Ernie. Going back into the field, um, the big question of you know what is our um, large round circular feature seemed to resolve itself um, by making itself a, a bit more complicated. We'd done some scientific dating over the winter and that was a 12th century date which puts it right in, in phase for the construction of the Benedictine monastery, so, so later than what we were most interested in. This is so exciting. <laughs> coming out of the pandemic, we can actually bring our specialists back to site now. And um, so Jerry McDonnell, our archaeometallurgist, came on site. And he brought with him a portable XRF, which means he's able to basically zap something in very scientific, technical terms. It's looking at the potential geology, the presence of metals, these sorts of things. And from looking at that, he can kind of make an assessment of what um, it might have been. It's like a tiny spaceship. Yes, so what Jerry's doing is just doing some XRF in across the bottom of the bowl to see what kind of readings you get, to see what it might be. And it was at that point that he said, I think we've probably got a lime kiln. Effectively, a big cement mixer for the construction of the Benedictine monastery. It's a lime kiln. <laughs> <laughs> it is a lime kiln. It is a lime kiln. That, that's what we, we hoped it was. Yeah. Our, 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 our working hypothesis. Yeah. Guess. Yeah. That, that, that Makes sense. Perfectly. It was a bit like an oh yeah, of course, kind of a moment. Got the context for it. Yeah. The construction of the priory. <laughs> yeah. It all works. Yes. Brilliant, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't hear any talk of lime fields from any of you last year, so do you feel like you missed what was staring you in the face? <laughs> <laughs> we had thrown that idea around some sort of kiln, some sort of like, oven, something, and this would grow out of it. What we didn't ever have was the evidence to back up that interpretation, so getting Jerry onto the site and using the kind of the, the scientific analysis as you're excavating makes that huge difference. So the circular feature has an actual name. I think that's what most excites me about it. You can't get a much nicer archaeology than that, really. However, it's Norman, so it's not Saxon. as I said repeatedly on site, my trench made the comeback of the century. I mean, it has been a massive comeback. It has we... been the comeback of the century. Comeback, comeback of the century is what I said. This trench, and I don't know if I've said this before, has made the comeback of the century. Because Trench 2 didn't, East didn't seem to be bringing up anything other than these burials, I think we were all starting to question whether it was worth going back at all. What's the It's a weird little box. And I'm really glad we did because of what we found. <laughs>